Yeah. Yes, good evening, Jim. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Oh, you sound loud and clear. Oh, good. I'm going to actually let me put my phone where I where I want to have it and see if it's uh, am I still am I still loud at that point? Sure. Okay. Go right ahead. So, that's this is kind of where I want to have it. Can you still hear me okay? I can. I can. Say a few more okay. things. Sure. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Okay. All right. So can we um, practice switching um, from yours to mine for a second? Sure, of course we can. Um, are you, what are you seeing now on the screen? I see your, your screen. Okay. So I am going to now change it to you. Okay. All right. So now um, if you want to bring yours up, you have a white screen. Oh, okay. So this is what happened last time too. When I um, go to play my presentation, I can't, I lose my, I lose my arrow. So oh, I'll, just, okay. um, I'll just switch over before. Um, um, yeah. Okay. 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 There it is. There it is. So, so you may just okay. want to leave it up. Um, yeah. I mean, this is the, um, but the, this is the, the first slide like, like that. I mean, that's the full screen. Okay. Um, that's good. Okay. That's so good. the thing is, like I said, I don't have my, um, I don't have my arrow. Um, so I just have my key, my computer keys to work with, which is fine. Um, so, yeah, let me, okay. um, here, let me just jump ahead here for a second okay. to something. Looks like it's moving pretty um, good. And for those who are joining us, we're just doing a, uh, a few last minute uh, uh, technical checks before we get started. So um, thank you for joining us. For those who are just now coming on, we should be starting in about uh, nine minutes. Okay, Anna, we can switch back to you. Okay. Are you feeling comfortable with that? Yeah. So I, do I just get, I say stop sharing? Everyone, we have three minutes. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Sit back, grab a pen and a pad. 
Thank you for joining us tonight, and we look forward to hearing your questions at the end of this wonderful presentation. All right, everyone, good evening, and thank you for joining us once again. Welcome to our monthly series, Inspiring Ideas from Experts in the Field. The webinar is currently in our third year for NOFA Mass, and it is our hope that we can make quality farm management education easily accessible to everyone, anytime, and anywhere. My name is Anna Gilbert Muhammad, and I am the Food Access and Webinar Coordinator for NOFA Mass. My email is Anna at nofamass.org. Feel free to contact me with any feedback about this webinar or any webinars that we have archived. And if you have any questions or any ideas or comments about our food access, food justice programs. Before we get started tonight, I'd like to take some time to thank our sponsors, the Greenleaf Foundation and Chelsea Green for supporting the production of this episode. Also, Many thanks to all of the NOFA Mass staff and board who have helped to make this workshop possible. And for the use of our new webinar portal that we've been using since the start of the year um, for this webinar series. If you're not currently a member of NOFA Mass, please consider joining to support our education, our policy work, our uh, organic food guide, our conferences. We truly appreciate your membership. And for those who are on the line and watching uh, via this webinar, if you're a member, thank you again for being such a steadfast member. You can go to our website to learn more about all of our programming. Tonight's presenter is Jim Schultz, owner and operator of Red Shirt Farm in Western Mass. Tonight's format for this webinar will be a presentation first with questions at the end. And you are free to submit questions during Jim's presentation. You can do it in two ways. You can use the question button and type in your question, and I will give that to Jim once he concludes. Or you can text me at 413-214-1237, particularly if you are listening by phone or if you're having any issues with the question feature uh, on the dashboard, you can text me those questions. And once again, uh, my number is 413-214-1237. So at this time, I will not take any further delay. We're so happy to have Jim with us tonight. Um, I will turn the presentation over to him. And Jim, I think you are ready to go, correct? Yes. Okay. 
And you can bring your screen up whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you see that, Anna? I certainly can. Okay. Well, thank you, Anna, and thanks for everybody who's um who's on the webinar with us. Um, again, as Anna said, my name is Jim Schultz. Um, I'm a farmer, and um, um, I've been um, involved in agriculture since I was uh, 19. This is me working on a horse card farm up in up in Maine. Um, where I sort of cut my teeth on some organic techniques and specifically working with uh, the draft horses. Um, I was involved with agriculture for a while, but um, took a number of years off to raise my family and to be a public school educator. Um, in the last decade or so, we started Red Shirt Farm. Um, and in the last five years, uh, since I retired from the school system, I'm now farming full time um, on our farm. And we, um, we're a regenerative, diversified farm. Um, we raise um, about two and a half acres, two acres or so of um, vegetables, um, pastured heritage uh, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. Um, and one of our um, sort of real tenets and uh, in takeaways from what we've been doing is that, you know, um, how food is produced really matters in terms of the, um, the health of the soil, um, the health of the animals on the farm and the health of the people that that we're feeding. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of those um, some of those techniques today. Uh, this is our farm. Um, we're on about uh, ten acres, and we lease three. And um, we're small, but we um, produce a lot of food. We have an 85 member CSA. We um, produce for a farmers market. Uh, we have a couple wholesale outlets and some and some restaurants. We're also passionate about education. Having been a teacher myself for 25 years, um, we felt that we um, definitely wanted education to be part of our mission. Um, these are some of our apprentices. Um, we bring on two to four apprentices every year, um, and they stay for um, the season to learn um, how to farm sustainably the way that, the way that we do. And we're also involved with uh, Roots Rising, which is a high school, a local high school group that comes to the farm um, weekly to, um, to work with us. So, yeah, this is part of our goal, growing young people who will change how we eat and farm. So I'm going to be talking today about managing your soil um, and kind of taking a historical perspective and kind of bringing it home and bringing it local and talking about specific techniques that you can be using. But, um, you know, for time immemorial, for the last 10,000 years um, since the development of agriculture, we've thought of agriculture as putting um, plow to the soil. And it started back in 10,000 years ago, but we just kept going and going, increasing the amount of tillage and, and plowing and disruption of the soil that we do, um, thinking that that is how we have to do agriculture. That's how we have to feed the world. But the results are not so positive. We're using four tons per acre per year of our, of our topsoil, um, which amounts to 1.7 billion tons annually in the U.S. And that's 3.4 tons per person um, in the world, actually, per year. 3.4 tons of topsoil per person per year, which it's hard, kind of hard to wrap your head around. But if you think a 30 soccer field of soil per minute is what we're losing, and that for every pound of food that we grow, we're losing six pounds of our topsoil. That's not a good, not a good equation. Um, agriculture and the deforestation that is being done in the name of agriculture, specifically. Um, in countries like Brazil to, to open up the Amazon for, for agriculture. Um, those two things have, um, contribute, make, make up the second largest contributor of, of climate change, of global warming that, that we're facing today. Um, a lot of the areas that have been intensively farmed um, are now becoming deserts. We've lost a third of our farmable land in the last 40 years. And um, not only are we seeing that, that decline in our uh, ecology, but we're also putting ourselves at risk. Most of the major civilizations um, in, in history have um, declined or, or been lost um, due to the result of, of agriculture. This is a picture of um, what they call the Fertile Crescent. Um, it's southern Iraq, uh, Syria, um, Israel, Egypt. Um, and it used to be the um, location of Eden on Earth. It was one of the most fertile areas um, on the planet that gave rise to a lot of our cultural advances. Um, and this is how it looks today, um, largely as a result of, of agriculture. So 
So farming in general, the way we do it now is, is basically degenerative. Um, but for all those, all those negatives, ironically, um, agriculture can be, can be the solution to the problems that we're facing today, specifically with climate change. So it's not, it's not the tractor, it's, it's how we're using it. Um, on the right, you see a, a no-till tractor that is um, uh, not disturbing the soil, but planting directly into an established um, crop. Um, it's not CAFOs, it's not the cow, it's the how. Um, factory farming um, is, is a problem, but um, it's not the cows, it's how we're actually farming. If we are using intensive grazing and rotational grazing, um, we can actually be improving the soil, increasing organic matter, and not causing the, the problems that factory farming is causing. This is a, a farm in South Africa where they typically get only eight inches um, of rainfall per year uh, compared to our roughly 40 inches here. Um, but these are two farms side by side, divided um, just by a, a fence. And the difference between them um, is only in how they're farming. Um, the ranch on the left um, is not is just letting uh, the cattle roam freely and eat what they want. On the right, we're seeing a holistically managed ranch where there's managed um, intensive grazing. So, um, you know, we, for many years now, we've been talking about or, or aspiring to sustainable agriculture. But I just want to say that I think the terminology, and I think more and more people are realizing this, that the terminology needs to change. This is what, we don't want to sustain this, right? We want to regenerate our soil, regenerate the planet. Um, and so the, the term really shouldn't be sustainable agriculture, but regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture is going to increase the ecosystem carrying capacity over time, as opposed to conventional agriculture, which is de degenerating it, and sustainable agriculture, which is just maintaining what we have. Um, so you know, regenerative agriculture is a new term. So basically, it's describing farming and grazing practices that uh, reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter, restoring degraded soil and biodiversity, and all of that results in carbon drawdown and an improved water cycle among other things. So that's a complicated definition, but simply, if agriculture is causing regeneration, then it's regenerative agriculture. And regeneration is just um, increased new growth. So how, what's the difference between degenerative and regenerative in terms of specific practices? Um, tillage is degenerative. Um, by tilling the soil, you're adding oxygen to the soil, which is oxidizing the carbon that's there. Um, and um, putting that up into the atmosphere. And it's releasing water to the atmosphere, whereas no-till is able to sequester carbon and keep water in the soil. Um, bare soil is degenerative. Cover crops um, and all the benefits, the eco ecosystem services that they provide are regenerative. Uh, chemicals, um, degenerative, um, not using chemicals, but using um, biodiversity and biological methods um, are regenerative. Uh, chemical farming um, has a whole host of problems, but one of the biggest ones is kind of highlighted in that picture is that um, adding nitrogen fertilizer to the soil produces nitrous oxide, which is one of the most um, harmful um, um, chemicals for the, for the atmosphere and, and climate change. Um, we talked about CAFOs being degenerative, plant grazing regenerative. Um, annual crops versus perennial crops. So going for biodiversity, multi-layers um, and, and, and perennial crops. So here we have on the right, annual and perennial crops mixed. Um, that's gonna sequester carbon and store hydrogen, uh, store water in the soil. So here's, a, um, I just wanna show this because it's a very short um, video that really um, summarizes um, the, the, the core concepts that we'll, we'll be talking about today. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our climate. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored in planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out
figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil fuel, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting the environment. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this. The way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. So um, the solution is right under our feet. It is the soil. Um, and global regeneration starts with the soil and sequestering that carbon into the, into the ground, into the soil. So um, science tells us right now that there, we have about 405 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's right on the borderline of what um, you know, could be the tipping point for, uh, for our atmosphere. But we still, we still supposedly we have some time. Um, we're adding 2.3 parts per million per year, or 18 gigatons. Um, and it, but it's estimated that with regenerative agriculture practices, we could sequester 300 gigatons of that carbon dioxide into the soil. So if only 10 to 20 percent of our farms switch to these regenerative practices we're going to be talking about, we could stop the increase of CO2. And that's just 10 to 20 percent of the farms. If we had a bigger swing, um, we could actually start reversing um, the, climate, the CO2 um, that we have in our atmosphere. And how does that happen? We talked a little bit about, we saw in that, that video, um, but let's look a little bit more detail. Um, so I don't know if you guys remember your, um, your biology, but um, there was a um, classic uh, experiment done by a man named um, Von Helmet back in the 1600s um, where he took a, a tree, um, a five pound willow tree, put it in a, in a big tub of 200 pounds of soil and wait for, that tree, wait for that tree to grow up to about 180 pounds. So the tree grew from five pounds to 180 pounds and it was in 200 pounds of soil. The theory back then was that plants ate soil, that they got everything they needed from the soil, and that the soil then would be um, way less after that tree had been fully grown. But what he found was the soil weighed exactly the same, and that the tree had grown not from what was in the soil, um, but from the carbon dioxide in the water um, that, was, that was supplied. So if you remember, again, your biology photosynthesis is taking um, uh, sunlight and water um, and combining that to um, through a process obviously to um, make sugar um, co2 and and water I'm sorry make sh sugars which are, are carbon based 
Um, the way that happens is um, um, this is a stomata. Um, it's, it's enhanced a little bit, as you can tell, with that little red the red um, mark. But that's these. Uh, there's about 300 of these for every square millimeter on the bottom of a, of a leaf, and this is where the gas exchange takes place. This is where the magic happens. Um, so that carbon dioxide is brought into the plant, um, and then it is brought down. Um, uh, photosynthesis occurs. Sugars are made, and those sugars are pushed down into the soil to feed to feed the microbes. So the tree is built from thin air, but so is the soil. Um, the way that happens is it's an exchange. Um, carbon dioxide, carbon carbohydrates rather, are um, exchanged with the microbes in the soil and exchanged for minerals and water. Um, so for every um, every uh, surface area of, of the root, um, there are um, fungi and bacteria um, colonizing those that um, live off of the exudates, the sugars that are secreted by the tree through its roots. And in exchange, those microbes um, will break down the minerals and, and provide and also pull water, um, they help to provide water for, for the plant. Um, it's amazing that 30 to 80 percent of all the sugars produced by the plant are shared. Uh, so there, it tells you the importance of the exchange that's going on there. If the plant is taking up to 80 percent of the sugars that it's making and giving them to those microbes that are in the soil. Um, so the exhibits um, are, are the sugars that are produced and those are given to those to the bacteria. Um, and what's also produced in the process by those by those microbes is a substance called glomalin, which is a glue that creates aggregates or um, um, binds the soil particles together so that they are they're not washed away, um, and that they're able to create pore spaces to hold hold more water. Um, and then a little note there at the bottom that a teaspoon of healthy soil has as many organisms as there are people on the planet. So it's just rich and teeming with those microorganisms um, that that help out the plants. So this is the the um, glomalin I was talking about, the protein that binds together the um, um, the mineral, the um, soil particles. And this is a microscopic picture of um, the um, the fungal hyphae um, that um, that create an association with the with the root of the plant and dramatically um, increase the root area or the amount of surface area um, that the plant has has to work with. So you see on the left, that's a plant um, without mycorrhizal fungi, or without those um, the um, soil mycorrhizal fungi. And once um, that uh, relationship is established and the fungi have, have colonized the roots, then um, you can see how much more root surface area there is um, to bring in minerals and water for the plant. And here's um, some of the results. If um, you see on the left, plants that are grown um, with mycorrhizae, and plants that are grown um, without in that top picture. And on the right-hand picture, it's reversed with, with the mycorrhizae and without the dramatic difference that results. Um, so the um, mycorrhizal fungi, those, those fungal um, ha uh, root hairs, if you will, um, are provide not only minerals and water to the plant, but they create a network, um, almost like an internet um, between the plants that allow them to communicate with one another. It's fascinating the, what they're finding. Um, and for instance, uh, when a plant um, is attacked, so one plant in a long row, they didn't, didn't experiment, and they put plants, plants out in a row. Um, and in a, in a laboratory environment, but they also replicated this out, out in, in, in the field. And when the plant at the end was um, attacked by aphids, all plants have a natural defense mechanism. Um, and they put out, they increase <clears throat> chemicals which act as, as a natural insecticide to kill off the aphids, or at least make them less palatable um, for, for the insects that are attacking them. Not only did the plant that was being attacked um, start to produce those chemicals, but the plants that were, we, were, that were separated from the protected from the aphids also produced the same chemicals. And that was because the plants had that underground network by which they were able to communicate with one another. Um, so just switching gears a little bit here, here's, a, here's an example of, uh, on the left, a carbon-rich um, soil, a soil that has been, um, hasn't been disturbed. And there's also, I, I believe this is a um, terra prete from um, uh, the Amazon region um, where um, the, um, 
I'm sorry, I'm trying to blank here, um, where um, uh, there was a lot of the burning of the, of the organic matter that, that uh, created a, a, a rich um, and permanent uh, carbon base in the soil that created a healthy soil that was able to be um, cultivated for, for many, many, many years. Um, the soil food web um, is important, an important concept that's becoming more and more um, widespread and, wide, and widely accepted, but um, there's just a whole ecosystem of, of not only bacteria and fungi, but larger um, organisms that are dependent on um, healthy ecology in the soil that's disrupted when we till and when we apply um, herbicides and pesticides. So regenerative agriculture, there are five basic principles. Um, one is that we don't disturb the, the soil. We minimize um, tillage or disruption of the soil as much as possible. We keep living roots in the ground as much as possible. We create a soil armor um, by having cover crops uh, or mulches and, and always have, have a cover over the soil. Um, you think where in nature is the soil not covered? Um, so we're trying to create the same natural environment um, with that soil armor. Um, then it's again the natural principle of biodiversity. Nowhere in nature do we find a monoculture. So having a um, multi-species polycultures um, are what we're striving for. And then again, nowhere in nature do we have just plants. Integrating animals into the system is, is critical. So these are the five principles of regenerative agriculture. So let's kind of talk about bringing them down, bringing them back home. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, a common site in many um, home gardens and small acreages where, you know, people are trying to um, start a garden or get their garden going for the, going for the season. The tiller gets pulled out and you create, uh, you know, this very soft, perfect seed bed. Um, but what you're doing in the process um, is creating a, a plow pan or a, a compacted layer where the um, actual blade of the tiller um, um, is creating a slick layer that is impenetrable to water um, and to roots. Um, so, and not only that, um, but you are uh, raising the um, uh, weed seed that you have in your soil. You have a huge weed seed bank, and by tilling, you're actually bringing that to the top and increasing your um, your weed problem. So, but the, what do you do if you don't use the tiller? Um, if you're not going to turn over the soil, um, what you know? What do you, what do you do? How do you get rid of the sod that you have there that you need to start? So, one of the more common, or one of the common techniques that's becoming more common. Um, is using tarps. So basically pieces of plastic, um, large pieces of plastic, there's most commonly on small farms you're using silage tarps, so tarps that farmers use to um, cover their silage um, for, uh, for feeding cows in the winter. So that same material, uh, black on one side, white on the other, black side goes up um, and it's used for um, what's called occultation or um, uh, basically a way to suppress um, the growth of the, of the saw that's underneath that and allow that to break down and be a, and not need require any tillage. Um, another common practice is using cardboard uh, as the instead of plastic um, using using cardboard and uh, back to plastic I mean we're trying to minimize plastic as much as possible um, in a lot of the practices that the people are doing um, but if that plastic can last five years or more um, and be used um, to replace tillage and use of petroleum. It, that's not not that bad use necessarily of, of plastic. But here, cardboard is serving the same function. And cardboard, the cardboard breaks down. Um, the, the, usually, it's hide-based glues that are um, that are in the cardboard that actually provides a food source for the worms, um, as well as the organic matter that comes from the breakdown of the cardboard. Um, so you put the cardboard down, you weight it down, and cover it with um, um, hay, mulch, hay, or straw. And um, within, you know, just a few months, that's ready to plant into. Some people plant into directly by just putting holes through it um, and planting your transplants directly through it. It is hard, to, you know, very hard, obviously, to direct seed into that. But um, uh, once the cardboard is broken down and the hay is broken down, you do have a, a wonderfully um, rich um, uh, soil to plant into. Um, again, a way to replace uh, tillage with a tiller. Um, is a tool called the broad fork, and this allows you to um, loosen the, the soil down to a depth of up to a foot um, without turning the soil over. Um, that's one thing you're trying to avoid is taking that subsoil and putting it on the top um, when taking the top, topsoil and putting it underneath. 
So the broad fork allows you to do that. It's a very simple, elegant tool. You press it into the ground with your, with your foot and then pull back on the two handles and that loosens up the soil. Um, so another, uh, this, doesn't, this isn't necessarily getting rid of tillage, but it's another technique um, to use in your, your arsenal for regenerative agriculture, and that is to create permanent beds, um, beds that are going to be in the same place all the time, so you don't have to go back year after year and um, wipe everything out with, with a plow or with a tiller um, to create your new beds. You put the beds in, and they're there the whole time, and that gives you the, another benefit that the walkways are the only place where compaction is occurring. Um, so that, that area you're sort of sacrificing because that's your area where you're going to be walking all the time and that, that can, does come, become somewhat compacted, um, but you're not um, walking on the beds and you're not having to turn that up every year. So a lot of times people hear raised beds and they think of the standard wooden side raised beds. And um, in this case, raised, the raised beds are just soil that's been um, piled up into, you know, shaped into mounds um, that, you're, that you're planting into. Um, another good practice is always to avoid working wet soil. I know there's always a temptation in the early spring to get out there and get working in the soil when it's um, just, you know, just opening up and it's typically we get a lot of rain at that time. Um, but anytime you're working wet soil, you're going to get a lot of um, much more compaction and really mess up your soil structure. So avoid wetting, working in wet soil whenever possible. Um, so yeah, again, in nature, the soil is never inverted. Um, things are the, the, the material that's adding to your topsoil and humus always falls from above, lands on the surface, and is broken down by the interaction of the microbes and worms and, and other um, organisms that, that are in the soil. Um, and we're never taking that material and incorporating it. In. So a lot of times people, you'll see people um, in their garden take and put on compost and then run it through with a tiller to turn it into the soil. I would encourage you to leave that on the top and let that be worked in, work that work in naturally. So um, when it comes to nutrition, um, people think oftentimes of, of uh, nitrogen or NPK, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and you see here, this is just a chart of um, the increase in, in chemical nitrogen that's been applied um, over the years from the 1960s up to relatively current. Um, and for all that increase in nitrogen, um, there has been, you see how, how much Asia is adding uh, compared to some other countries, um, in, even compared to the United States. But anyway, with all that increase in the nitrogen fertilizer, we haven't seen um, a, a comparable increase in the growth of, of plants. In fact, what we've seen is a lot of environmental degradation, a lot of that nitrogen um, gets washed away into the waterways. And here, in, in this case, in the case of the United States, it's washed down through all our major river uh, riverways um, into the Gulf of Mexico, um, where we have now a dead zone, a huge dead zone in the Gulf um, as a result of the um, eutroph uh, eutrophication that happens from the nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. Um, so to start with, um, if you're not going to apply chemical fertilizer, and again, that's what we suggest that you do is avoid those, um, well, how do you start? Well, the, the way to start is with the soil test. This is a soil probe um, that allows you to extract a column of soil, but you can just do it with a, with a trowel or a spade. Um, so you want to take uh, random samples of um, soil from around your garden. Um, if you go to any soil test lab, they'll give you the, the directions that you're doing, um, uh, getting a random sa or a sampling of uh, soil about six inches deep and number of places around um, the area that you're testing, mixing it together, um, and then sending in a two prep roughly um, sample to, um, to a lab. who will test the soil and give you back an analysis that tells you what you need to, what you need to apply to the soil. So once you know what you're deficient in, then you can start um, adding organic amendments that may um, alleviate the deficiencies that you, that you have. One of the things that you need every year um, that plants require, um, and not necessarily as much as we think once we get things in balance. Again, you look if you look at nature, um, nature doesn't ever have, uh, um, you know, a concentrated nitrogen source added to it other than animal manure. Um, but anyway, here are some organic um, um, nitrogen sources. Blood meal is um, very high in nitrogen, also very expensive. Um, fish emulsion, 
alfalfa meal, soybean meal, cottonseed meal, composted manure. Um, the meals are, are wonderful. Um, it, it, sometimes it's hard to find organic sources for those, um, but alfalfa meal is something that we use widely on our farm as well as, um, as, well as fish, fish emulsion. For phosphorus and calcium, you're looking at um, bone meal, saffron phosphate, rock dust, salmon, minerals with phosphorus, and um, on for potassium, kelp is a wonderful source, um, as well as wood ashes if you have a fireplace. Um, and green sand is, a, is actually a mineral um, that you can get to apply for, for potassium. So that covers your NPK. Um, but a lot of times um, what's forgotten in that, and, and it's kind of a crossover from chemical agriculture, which is focused so heavily on the, on the big three NPK, um, is your trace minerals, um, which can have a, a dramatic effect on the growth of your, of your, growth of your plants. Um, for instance, um, boron um, is, is commonly deficient in soils here in New England, um, and adding it um, will dramatically improve specifically things like beets, um, preventing um, black rot and hollow core and your brassicas and things like that. Zinc, copper, manganese, and iron are all um, critical components of, of photosynthesis and will help your plants um, in that regard. Um, lime is something that people think they need to apply all the time. Be careful with it. Um, lime um, isn't so much a way to manage your pH, but as a way to add calcium. And there's other ways to get calcium into your soil. The calcium-magnesium ratio is really important um, in terms of the, um, the texture of, of your soil. Um, too much magnesium can make a really tight, um, really tight, dense soil. So that's something that your soil test will tell you where, where you're at and how you, um, what you can do to rectify any problems that you may have. Um, so again, don't fertilize it blindly. Use that soil test um, and apply amendments and compost to the soil surface. Uh, compost is, has been for a long time sort of the, the um, golden child of organic agriculture. And um, it is, has all of these, all of these benefits. Um, I would, um, say that, that compost is, is tricky. It's not quite as easy as it's made out to be. It's hard to make good compost. It's hard to find good commercial compost. Um, and you really need to get that, that tested as well. But the benefits are um, definitely increasing organic matter, um, increasing fertility somewhat, depending again on the nature of the compost, um, it, uh, holds water for your soil, improves the soil structure. If you have a clay soil, um, it makes it less, um, it loosens it up. If you have a sandy soil, it allows it to bind more, um, bind more nutrients in there and water as well. Improves soil aeration. Um, it's very microbial rich if you have a good compost. Um, it will balance out pH to some extent, again, depending on what the nature of the compost is. Um, and um, by, um, uh, again, incorporating that, you're not going to get the crust that you sometimes get um, with the soil without it. So when you're making your own compost, um, some things to consider are um, the balance of the compost. A lot of times folks will take their food scraps uh, from, you know, from the kitchen and just pile it in the backyard and that's, that's their compost. Um, you're going to end up with probably a slimy anaerobic um, compost if, you're, if that's what you're doing. You want to have a balance of your brown and your green, your dried leaves and your fresh weeds or your kitchen compost. Um, and um, yeah, have, have that balance going. Volume is also important. If you want your compost to heat, you need a pile that's, that's a reasonable size. Typically, um, a cubic yard um, is, is about what it takes to get um, good heating in your, in your compost. If what you're looking for is to um, kill weed seeds um, uh, and to um, kill any pathogens that might, that might exist there. Um, so here you see a you know, classic kind of um, three-bin compost system um, where things, the raw material goes in the left and then it's turned into the middle bin and then finally into the finished bin. And you can see some, some looks like squash growing in, that, in there as well, probably volunteers. Um, compost should be, um, have a good amount of aer aeration. You don't want to go anaerobic. Um, it should be, the moisture level should be about the consistency of a freshly wrung sponge. So have moisture, but not be, not be too wet and definitely not being dry. If your compost is dry, you're not going to get the, the biological activity that you need, need going on there. Covering it is, is useful um, because then you can manage that moisture without a, a big rainstorm creating a too wet anaerob anaerobic compost. And there's two kinds of um, approaches to, to compost. Um, probably one that's the 
one of the ways that people are more familiar with is turning it frequently. In fact, the organic standards require that you turn it to maintain um, a certain temperature, getting up to 140 degrees, and then um, you know turning it multiple times over the, over the span of about six weeks. Um, that's a thermophilic compost. But more and more, um, there is a movement, I would say, towards static compost, which is just creating a pile with adequate aeration um, and letting it sit. And the reason for that is it allows um, the, the fungal um, um, hyphae that are developing in that compost to, to stay intact and not be broken up every time you turn it. Um, and any biology that's going on there, you're, you're allowing it to kind of do its thing without disrupting it through constant turning. Commercial compost, um, yeah, it's very difficult to produce enough, enough compost. Even if you're composting everything you have and you have a small backyard garden, you probably will not have enough compost to do what you, what you would like to do. So commercial compost is an alternative um, that's usually made through a thermophilic, so a very frequent turning process. Um, so, um, and you also can't be sure of what the um, initial materials um, were unless you're dealing with, a, say, a dairy farmer who's just composting his dairy manure. Um, so ask for nutrient analysis if they have it. Um, if they don't, um, you can send it, you can get a sample and send it to a lab to get it analyzed. Um, if you can also have it tested for, um, for herbicides, those are, those are difficult to do. Um, the, test, the tests aren't widely available. Um, the persistent herbicides uh, would come in on, say, uh, landscaper waste, um, uh, um, grass clippings and things like that. They've been sprayed with, with a lawn, it's been sprayed with an herbicide. And some of those herbicides do not break down um, and can persist for up to three years and cause problems with your plants. It's an herbicide, so therefore it's killed plants. Um, we actually got compost from a, um, a, com a commercial compost operation using it for a school garden. Nothing grew in the garden, and, and we didn't, um, you know, that was the first year. That was the first year we used that compost, and that was the first year we had nothing grow in the garden. And it was most likely because there are persistent herbicides in that compost. Um, Manure-based composts um, have, are something to, to, you know, again, ask if you're making your own compost and it's heavily from manure, or you're buying your compost and it's coming from a place that is using a lot of manure in the compost, it's likely going to be high in phosphorus and potassium and salts, which for a small application or a one-time application may not be um, that bad, but if you're applying it regularly, then you may create an imbalance in your soil um, and be actually be causing more problems than, than, than helping the soil. Uh, compost teas are beneficial, um, again, depending on the type of compost you have. Taking a bag of, of compost um, or a, a, a filtered bin and letting it soak um, and uh, then pouring that on as a, um, as a fertilizer is, um, is very beneficial. Again, depending on what the nature of the compost is and, and how you're making it, but it can have, have good benefits. A very new system that, I, that we experimented with this year um, that I, I'm really liking, it's called the Johnson 2 Compost Bioreactor. And um, all it, it's a static composting system. Um, so if you see the picture on the left, it just uses uh, landscape fabric um, with a, a remesh, so the kind of mesh that you put in concrete, which is very inexpensive. Um, and so you create this cylinder, and then you put PVC, perforated PVC pipes down in this star configuration, as you can see on the right. Um, and they quickly, um, the um, biology in the uh, material that you're putting in, which is leaves, uh, chips, and, and potentially manure, or what you have in hand. Right now, they're using Johnson Sue, um, David Johnson, he's the professor there, and his wife, Elaine Sue. They are putting in just leaves now and having success as well. So the reason to do this is that because of those aeration tubes, you have um, a, a aerobic compost that doesn't require any turning. Um, and what they're finding is um, tremendously more biological diversity um, probably because you're, you're not disturbing the biology by turning it all the time. Um, and it's odor-free, um, requires no work. So we're really happy with our experiment. It's used not so much like regular compost, but more as an inoculant. So it's a biological inoculant as opposed to a soil amendment. Vermicompost is warm compost, um, has a huge range of benefits. Um, and we use it, um, we've noticed a big difference with it side-by-side tests with germination. Um, it definitely improved germination. The seedlings were more robust. Um, just 
overall, anything that we were using with a vernal compost tended to do tends to do better. Things to avoid. Um, you walk into any Home Depot, and the first thing you see if you walk in from the garden section is shelves and shelves of, of Roundup, which is um, a Monsanto um, produced uh, herbicide. Um, and it's it's a shame it's there because people think that that's what they're supposed to use to to kill weeds. Um, and what it's, it's been proven to be, uh, you know, it does kill weeds, yes, but ultimately it's ineffective. And we'll look at some charts as to why. Um, it's it's been um, classified as a um, as a class two carcinogen. I believe it's class two, um, which means it's very likely to be um, to cause cancer. It's very likely that it is a carcinogen. It's not definitively a carcinogen, but it's very likely to be. Um, and using some of the regenerative practices we're going to talk about in a little bit can get much as good effect, um, if not, and, and much better soil health as a result. So try to eliminate herbicides. Um, this is a case where um, uh, Monsanto developed Roundup to be used with their Roundup ready seeds of corn, cotton, and soybeans. So they could overspray a crop um, and kill all the weeds without killing the main crop. Um, so you can see the, the increased adoption of, of those um, those kind of, ironically, um, despite what they, they claimed, um, we haven't seen um, a big increase in the in productivity as a result of, of using those. But what we have seen is a dramatic increase in super weeds or weeds that are immune to the to Roundup or glyphosate, which is the the, you know, the chemical that's being that's in uh, in Roundup. Um, so weeds that that are now persistent and can't be killed with Roundup um, have increased dramatically, just like we saw with insects and insecticides. Insects quickly became um, developed, uh, uh, you know, genetic. Uh, um, genetic changes that allow them to be um, immune to and tolerant to the, the insecticide. Same thing with the weeds. Um, so not only are we finding 75% um, of our air and rain samples um, contain Roundup, but it's also been um, found to be in your in your breakfast cereals and other uh, grain-based crops because um, Roundup, in addition to being an herbicide, is used as a desiccant. So it's a kill to get all of the Puts and wheat and and um, other grain crops dry at the same time before it's harvested with a mechanical um, combine. It's sprayed with um, Roundup or another herbicide to um, to to dry it down to kill it. Um, and that right right before it's harvested, so that residue is in a lot of your grain-based crops. Another common herbicide is 2,4-D, um, and um, that's commonly used in a whole variety of crops, from asparagus to um, potatoes. It's also sprayed in waterways and wetlands to kill um, aquatic weeds. Uh, it's been found to, um, it's linked to non-Hodgkin's um, lymphoma, um, so because of cancer, it's been linked to par Parkinson's disease and, and other immune and reproductive um, problems. So it's another common herbicide that's very readily available. So if you're not going to use an herbicide, what can you use? Um, some just in sort of ingeniously simple techniques that are just as almost almost as effective, I would say more effective in, in terms of the whole ecological scheme. Um, and one of them is called stale seed bedding. So what you're doing is encouraging weed seeds to germinate and then killing them as soon as they come up. Um, so when they're a very small state and the way, so then when you're, when you're planting, you're planting into a weed-free bed. So you're germinating the weed seeds, killing them, and very and we'll talk about how you kill them, um, and then planting into that bed, which now has no weed seed in it. Um, some ways to stale seed bed are um, just by using a clear sheet of plastic. It's called solarization. So you're basically um, encouraging those weed seeds to germinate and then frying them under um, a sheet of plastic, which is only down for a day or two, um, sometimes up or just three, depending on whether it's a cloudy day or not. Um, but that's not enough. It's enough temperature to kill any uh, weed seeds that are germinated, but not enough to cause any um, damage to soil organisms. Occultation is also, it's just uh, instead of using clear plastic, you're using a, a black plastic. Um, a scuttle hoe is just a, a, basically a knife that goes through um, on the end of a hoe that cuts the um, top of the weed off from the bottom of the weed, um, thus killing it. And a time meter is just going through at the right stage. And it's, all it is is like a very flexible, rake and it pulls out the, um, the the very small weed seed. Another very effective technique is called is flame weeding. Um, and this is just passing um, a flame over to um, quickly uh, sear, singe, and kill 
the uh, just germinated weed seed. This is a fantastic technique if you're growing carrots. Um, you plant the carrots in the ground, and at the same time you plant in carrots, at the end of the bed you may put you put in you know five to ten beet seeds where you know you'd be looking for them. As soon as the beet seeds germinate, they germinate about um, a day to two days before the carrot seeds. As soon as you see the beet seedlings, you grind through with your flame reader, kill all the weed seeds right before the carrots come up, and the carrots come up into a weed-free bed. That's flame weeding. It's also effective in other crops with carrots. It's just a dream because weeding carrots, as you, anybody knows, is a, is a real pain. So just once again, don't till. Um, don't turn the soil. Um, your, your soil is full of, of weed seeds. Um, no matter how good, you're, how diligent you've been, um, you're likely to have, even if you haven't allowed any weed seeds to be going to your, your soil, there's weed seed that's blown in. And um, so you have what's called a seed bank, and by tilling, you're bringing those seeds up. So if you don't till, you're not you're not increasing your your weed weed problem. Um, another way to discourage weeds is with um, soil cover. So by planting very intensely, you can see the lettuce um, a canopy, the the leaves um, has shaded out completely the soil, and weeds do not do well without without that sunlight to to go into. So having a very tight uh, crop is um, is beneficial. Another that way you may say, well, okay, if I'm putting in a crop like um, you know, broccoli, when the seedlings are young, the, the soil is still showing. How do I deal with that? Well, you intercrop. So intercropping is planting two crops together. So when you put in your, say, your broccoli, um, you plant lettuce at the same time into those spaces in between the broccoli. And by the time the broccoli is big enough, you harvested a crop of lettuce and you've kept the soil covered the entire time. Other ways to cover the soil with mulch, hay, straw, leaves, compost, wood chips, and landscape fabric are all effective mulches that can keep the soil covered and keep um, weed seed from growing. Here's a case of uh, intercropping in a high tunnel. Um, you can see the tomato seedlings on the stakes there, and then right next to them um, is lettuce. Um, basil is another common intercrop. Um, basil and pepper is another common intercrop. Um, so intercropping is a, is a great technique. Um, here you can see some straw, um, looks like straw mulch there, yeah. Um, and again, keeping the soil covered um, with the scourge weed seeds, holding moisture, keep the soil cooler, um, and just um, make it a much more pleasant space to be working in as well. Um, mulching um, avoids the uh, effects of, of raindrops, um, which you say, I want rain. But a raindrop is actually hitting the soil, bare soil, at 20 miles per hour. And this is a um, you know, macroscopic picture of what a raindrop hitting soil looks like. But hitting it at 20 miles per hour, um, it, it um, you know, uh, erodes the soil. Um, and it also creates a muddy wash where the silt um, ends up being on the top and the larger granules on the bottom. That's what causes that crusty layer that you, you may have experienced. Um, other benefits of mulch is moderate soil temperature, limits erosion, increases organic matter. It dramatically, if, if you haven't used mulch, and we did this, uh, the reason I'm so, I just still remember the first time we, when I was just starting out gardening and we um, ended up using heavy mulch and I couldn't believe the increase in worms when we pulled that, that mulch back. Um, it's a food for microbes. Um, it's the interface between the mulch and the soil, uh, reduces compaction. Um, improves infiltration, retains the moisture, and keeps the weeds down. Um, something that's, um, this is somewhat related to mulch, but more about soil cover um, and the soil cover that leaves can provide. Leaves, because they're a living entity and they're transpiring, um, are much cooler than, um, than, other, um, than things underneath it. So here, the leaf temperature on this particular day, monitored with an infrared um, thermometer, was 59.7. Holding a piece of paper um, just below the leaves um, was that was 89.6. Again, that the effect of biology and the transpiration, the cooling effect that happens through, um, through the leaves is, um, and that obviously isn't happening in the paper, and that's the counts of a higher temperature. But here is a dramatic one. Bare soil on the same day, same reading, right next door in a walkway was 138.2. So bare temperature, bare soil, um, it's extremely hot. Anytime the soil temperature gets above 100 degrees, um, you start to lose water dramatically. And once it gets past 130, you're losing microbes are dying. So this is a case where our microbial life and the soil surface is not doing so well. Um, another tenant, remember we talked about um, for, bio, for um, generative agriculture is keeping roots in the ground. 
um, roots in the ground. Um, uh, again, remember the, the whole exchange that we talked about, um, the sugar uh, root exudates going into the soil for the um, uh, microbes. And then when those microbes die, all the carbon that they've absorbed through those root exudates is now embedded into, embedded into the soil. When the plant dies or when the um, plant top is removed and the roots are left, that provides um, aeration, organic matter, and food as well for the microbes. So keep the roots in the ground. One way to have roots in the ground all the time is the cover crop. Um, here we have, um, uh, it looks like clover underneath corn. Um, and uh, this is a you know, short start contest, which you might see when you drive through the Midwest. It's just, just rows and rows of corn on bare soil. But having that cover crop underneath, you're providing nitrogen if that's clover, and it's clover. Um, you're protecting the soil in all the, way, all the ways we talked about, as well as increasing organic matter, um, controlling weeds, reducing compaction. Um, it also scavenges nitrogen. For chemical farmers that are applying nitrogen, having that cover crop will, will absorb any excess nitrogen and keep it from going into the waterways. Um, now, one of the problems with um, doing no-till, one of the tenets of regenerative agriculture is reducing tillage. Um, if you're putting down a cover crop, um, one of the hard things is, well, what do you do the next spring if you're putting down a winter cover crop and you have this cover crop material, what do you do with it? How do you break it down? Um, you know, typically you would take the filler and run it through, but um, if you have a crop that actually is killed in the winter, like any of the mentioned top winter kill crops, oats, peas, uh, forward soy, barley, radishes, um, South Sudan grass, and buckwheat, those will grow, provide a cover crop, and die with the roots in the ground and a cover on the top and be ready um, to be raked off or planted through in, in the springtime. Um, if you do have a situation where you want a crop, a cover crop to stay over, the winter hardy ones will will, will do. Um, we talked about under sowing cover crops. Um, so you're putting in, um, again, so your broccoli in the fall. Um, and you say, well, if I want my broccoli to be harvested in October, um, but my cover crop's not going to germinate once I get into mid, late October, what you can do is um, sow in a cover crop at the same, just after you plant your, um, your broccoli seedlings, and you've got, when you take off the broccoli, there's your cover crop all ready to go, already in place. Tillage radishes are a type of cover crop that actually um, loosens the soil um, and tills naturally, if you will. That, that um, root can go down um, upwards of um, six inches to, to, or, or more um, and open up um, pore space. And if it's left there, and it, if it rots and decays, it's a food source. When it's completely gone, you have a... Um, uh, the soil loosened up where that, that plant radish was. Again, another tenor of regenerative agriculture is no monocrops, like we see at the top, but a diversity of crops, um, especially interplanting with some um, flowers that are going to attract beneficial, um, beneficial organisms uh, to, your, um, to your garden is, is essential. Um, attracting birds to your garden, bats to your garden, um, and beneficial native um, pollinators uh, as well. So this, this is habitat for um, the huge variety of pollinators that exist that we're not aware of because we think mostly of the honeybee. Um, these are houses and homes for those, those types of bees. And then the toad, of course. So um, we talked about the biology that's existing in the soil, but it's always, um, it's not a bad idea to inoculate your plants as you put them out with the fungi that you want to, to exist to create that, that um, uh, mycorrhizal situation that we, we looked at in that, that uh, microscopic picture. Um, so if you take, you can buy um, inoculant and you can dust your um, seeds and dust your seedlings before you put them out so you have that relationship already established when you put the plants in the ground. And finally, soil, um, soil makes you happy. This is just a recent study that came out it shows that there are actually microbes in the soil um, which trigger an immune response in our bodies. It's very much like serotonin. So it's very much like the um, antidepressant drugs that are, that are prescribed. So you know, the, the fact that working out in the soil, getting your hands dirty, um, people say that makes them feel so good. Well, it makes them feel good for a reason because of these, these microbes that are out there. So um, finally, um, this is a, a list, of, a very short list of resources that are essential. NOFA um, is putting on this, this talk. Um, the Biomutrient Food Association, um, Acres USA, and, and Kiss the Ground are um, all fantastic resources, which if you Google any of those, um, you'll get the link to those to their sites. So um, 
Thank you. I'm sorry I was droned on here without questions. We'll have time now for any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. What a fabulous presentation and very in-depth. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Um, uh, there's a question concerning uh, beds. Um, I'm sorry. The question is actually um, about composting in beds. And it says, do you see compost applications decreasing over time on permanent beds? Um, I assume that the question is asking, to, is, is the need for applying compost decreasing um, mm -hmm. over time? Um, we, in our, in our particular situation, that, that, has, that has been the case. Um, we've applied um, less compost over time as our soil um, improves mm -hmm. and the organic matter levels, levels go up. Um, I think uh, well-made compost, um, you know, the, one of the benefits is not so much as, um, as a soil amendment, but again, as, as an inoculant. So that's why we're really excited about that Johnson seed compost that, that we're talking about. The end product is very much like a paste. It's not something that you would have put that you would apply like you would regular compost where you would lay it on at, at the surface. It's more, it's a substance that will um, um, mix into almost like a soup um, into water and then spray onto our soil. So um, yes, the, to answer the question, we have um, reduced our, our compost as we, um, you know, as we get on into years you know, five and six and, and beyond that. Um, but we still apply periodically um, if we need to um, um, more for prophylactic than anything else, um, but it's not nearly as much um, or as frequently as we did at the beginning. Okay. And do you think it's possible that at some point the soil has reached a living level that it can mine all nutrients needed? Um, I, I believe that. I don't have um, scientific data myself to back that up. We're involved with a number of um, grants, um, uh, a conservation innovation grant through NOFA that's looking at um, the effects of regenerative um, practices um, on the soil and also on the nutrient density of specific crops. Um, so the, the biodynamic um, theory um, that you can, um, that the uh, system, that the soil and the organisms will produce and essentially biologically mine everything that you need for a healthy plant, um, I think is um, something to, to strive for. And I think it's also something that can ultimately be achieved. I personally haven't in our situation seen that yet. Um, so, and I, I still, you know, there's, there's the, the dichotomy in me, the, the hardcore scientist and then the more um, uh, sort of esoteric um, spiritualist and um, the hardcore scientist in me says, well, but New England soils are deficient in boron and selenium as two examples, and those are not going to materialize out of nothing. Um, so it's, it might be beneficial to add those. On the other hand, biodynamics has a principle of transmutation where some of these things can be created from other things. So I don't know. I would say that the um, the... In me, the jury's out. We'll have to have to wait and see and keep experimenting and observing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is kind of a philosophical question here. Is this, and speaking of just regenerative farming in general, is this practical on a large scale? And how can this kind of long-term goal be sold to big farms? And how can uh, large stakeholders be convinced that this is the correct choice in an ever-growing mm -hmm. population? So, what we'll end with that very loaded question? Yeah. So, um, yeah, a couple of ways to to go to answer that. Um, we had um, Brian O'Hara um, from uh, Tobacco Road Farm out to our to our farm for a workshop, and we are asked each of us was asked that that same question. Um, and Brian answered it much better than I did in, in some respects in saying that in terms of scaling up, um, you know, that there's such a need for this, this type of farming. And it is, um, you know, I would say perhaps more prevalent at this point um, on the smaller scale, um, sort of market garden, two acre to three acre size farm. 
Um, but the, the only thing that keeps it from, from growing to four acres and six acres and 10 acres is just, I mean, it is, it is a labor intensive system is just people who, who, um, uh, just hands, uh, hands and feet and hearts on the, on the ground. Um, so he said that his, his vision is just having, um, a bigger workforce and more local, um, small farms. Um, but to, on, a, on a sort of bigger, more practical scale, we're talking many thousands of acres. Um, we have somebody like Gabe Brown, who's a farmer out um, in, I want to say Minnesota. Um, I may be off, off on that. Um, who's farming thousands of acres and has um, uh, sort of pioneered a lot of um, innovative techniques in terms of multi-species cr cover crops and rotational grazing, where he's seen dramatic increases in organic matter um, in his soil in just um, a, a very short amount of time. In fact, something that you know, some soil scientists said, no, you, there's no way that you could be getting that much organic matter in that amount of time, but he, but he, but he has through these practices, and he's farming on thousands of acres. Um, so it's not um, um, unpractical. And the reason what drove him to it, ironically, was he was farming conventionally and had a number of years of um, failures, crop failures and bank failure, financial failures, um, and they, it kind of drove him to look at how it cost savings and ways to, to can stay on the farm without losing money and to be making money. And so he started to farm in this way. As soon as he cut out chemicals, he saved hundreds and thousands and thousands of dollars um, each year. Um, and so, and that it also in answer to that question, I think the incentive um, for the conversion of these conventional farmers to regenerative techniques has to be almost by necessity um, economic because that's that's what's gonna that's what's gonna drive them. I mean that you can um, you can pitch the um, you know the, the um, you know the ethics and morals and the biology and, and all that, but what comes down to it is if it's gonna make them money or save them money, um, you know, in the short term, that's what's gonna that's what's gonna convince them. Um, and also the I mean I would say no farmer very few farmers don't care about their land or about their animals. Um, so, you know, to see the changes that happen um, once these techniques are started to be used, even, you know, somewhat, um, the changes are pretty dramatic and pretty spectacular. Um, and that drives a lot of, a lot of the change. Um, so anyway, um, I, that was a rambling answer, but um, I, I think were there were any part of that question I missed? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And um, um, I know you had a question about where Gabe Brown's farm is actually located. It's near Bismarck, North Dakota. Okay, a, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> no somewhere way. out there. <laughs> right, exactly. In, in, a, in a pretty harsh climate, um, yes. he's just doing some fantastic work. Yes, he certainly is. He certainly is. Well, Jim, uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. That was our, indeed our last question. Uh, again, very in-depth, very informative. Um, if you did not get a chance to get your question answered here, Jim, can they contact you if they have any additional yep. questions? Just, um, you can email me at jim at redshirtfarm.com. Great. And I don't know if you're planning on attending uh, the NOFA Winter Conference, will you be presenting there? Yep, I'll be presenting. Um, we um, put up uh, what we call a climate battery, which is a, um, a sort of poor, poor man's, um, uh, at, it's, it's a way to heat a high tunnel without the use of, without the use of petroleum products um, by storing excess heat in the summer in the soil for the winter and shoulder seasons. So it's a sort of innovative design that's um, that's proving allowing us to um, grow in our in our uh, high tunnel through the winter without the use of um, propane. Okay, very good. That uh, is something that you I would really encourage everyone to go to to attend um, the NOFA uh, Winter Conference um, for 2020. I can't believe 2020 is here already. We'll be at Worcester State in January, um, January 11th. Um, Jim, as you just heard, will be one of the presenters there with this climate battery. Uh, so I encourage you to come out to see uh, this particular presentation. If you want more information on the conference, feel free to go to our website, nofamass.org, or you can contact me directly at anna at nofamass.org. 
This uh, webinar will be placed on our YouTube page and our archives within a, a couple of days. If you would like to get a link sent to you, just give me an email, I'll send it out to you. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone who joined us and who stayed on steadfastly. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for your, your time tonight with us going in depth on regenerative agriculture. Um, I've learned a great deal and I hope everyone has done the same. So I'm um, looking forward to next month where we will wrap up 2019 series with Anna uh, Moise, Anna Maria Moise, as she talks about cultivating a healthy gut biome and more information will be coming out soon for that. So once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending your evening with us. And until we see each other or hear each other again next month, have a great evening. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.